Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Rodrigo Menafra, and I'm Neopar's uh, Managing Director. It's great to see so many uh, familiar names here, but also uh, quite a few new names. So I'm hoping that these are folks that are going to get introduced to Neopar and Neopar's communities of practice. So welcome, everyone. It is uh, very important to understand the origins of the land in which we occupy space, our history and relationship to that land as well. Miopar is hosted at Dalhousie University in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy peoples first signed with the British crown in 1726. We are all treaty people and are responsible for advancing reconciliation. We encourage you to learn more about the indigenous people and the history of the land where you reside and explore anti-racist education and accountability. To get a sense of um, our reach today, we encourage you to share your ancestral territory, uh, where you're logging in from in the chat. If you don't know the ancestral land where you are, you can always use, uh, there's a, web, a website called native-land.cn.ca. So thank you again. Before we sort of dive in, uh, we, we're gonna go over some housekeeping uh, items. Uh, please do bear with me as uh, I am kind of joining here. Um, uh, uh, Alexa Goodman, uh, Miopar's training manager was uh, going to host this session and was behind all the planning, but she can't be with us today. So just bear with me as I kind of go through the program and hopefully I can stick with the, the planned program. Most of you are probably well aware of the uh, Zoom etiquette. I'm going to share my screen and go over some slides. We want to ensure that this is an open and safe environment uh, for everyone. Be, please be respectful when others are sharing their thoughts and ideas. We ask that you stay on mute uh, for today's uh, session. And during the larger group discussion, you're welcome to use uh, the raise your hand button and turning your audio on to ask for questions once uh, we call upon you. Uh, please note that uh, if you want to enable captions, you can do so uh, under the more button uh, and captions. Bridget and Isabel and myself will be monitoring the chat box. So if you have any questions about the session or you have any technical challenges, please do send us a message and we'll try and address it. Uh, please add your pronouns and organization affiliation after your Zoom in name so that we can kind of get a feeling where everybody's uh, joining us from as well. We encourage you to use the reactions uh, located at the bottom right of your screen to actively participate in the conversation, which, you know, this really is a great way to interact in these uh, virtual sessions nowadays. And finally, um, the session is being recorded as you first saw. This is our uh, agenda uh, for today. We're going to go over some opening remarks. We'll have the lightning presentations, an open discussion, lots of time for an open discussion at the end, and then uh, wrap up. Rodrigo, are you okay if I launch the poll now? Yes, please do. Okay. While I go over the opening remarks, you'll see there's a poll um, coming on. Please uh, uh, fill the poll and we'll go over some of the, those results. We just want to get a better sense of uh, where people are, are coming from. So for those that are new to MIOPAR, uh, the Marine Environmental Observation Prediction and Response Network uh, is a national network centers of excellence linking top marine researchers and highly qualified personnel across Canada with partner organizations and communities. At MIOPAR, we fund uh, leading edge research, promote collaborative research, and help train the next uh, generation of marine professionals. Uh, Miopar's Communities of Practice, uh, or the program, Miopar's Community of Practice program was first established as far back as uh, 2016. And over the years, Miopar has supported communities of practice by offering uh, some level of support, some, some funding support. COPs, our communities of practice, were always thought as uh, knowledge mobilization mechanisms or tools per se. But we have learned that, uh, you know, over this, this many years, we have learned that, in fact, 
than much more than that. And they also enrich research, encourage collaboration among researchers and between academics, practitioners, policymakers, and community groups. And MIOPERS uh, co-ops connect researchers and highly qualified personnel with industry, with other sectors, with industry, government, and community partners as well. Together, members share expertise and opportunities to learn as co-ops also provide a space and, and a place for discussion, for the co-production of knowledge, and also for sometimes uh, innovative uh, projects. In this regard, uh, co-ops have really become an essential part of MIOPAR's efforts towards a, a coordinated Canadian approach to ocean research. And uh, as such, we would like to continue to support communities of practice in the areas of ocean observation, prediction, and data management in the future. We hope that we can continue to do so uh, if we're successful with our recent application uh, for funding to the Strategic Science Fund, which we should know uh, later uh, in May uh, or June of this year. And in this uh, application, the Co-ops Communities of Practice program is really just another essential program of MIOPAR moving forward. Today, um, I'm really excited because uh, I'm just gonna change this slide. So today uh, we have here with us uh, Shari Kotar from the Canadian Coastal Resilience Forum, Emmanuel Debret from Netcolor, Megan Madison and Rob Pelot from the Canadian Marine, Marine Shipping Risk Forum, Ian Church, from the Canadian Ocean Mapping Research and Education Network, Richard Davis and Brad De Young from Ocean Gliders Canada, Austin Pugh from the Ocean Acidification Co-op, and last but certainly not least, Cindy Marvin from the Coastal and Ocean Risk Communication um, Co-op. I'll start sharing, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen so that uh, presenters can share theirs. And I'm just gonna share the results from the poll for folks. Uh, awesome. Quite spread out. It's good to see some government uh, reps as well. Uh, lots of biologists. Great. Thank you for filling the poll. So our first presenter, Sherry, I think uh, if you can go ahead and share your screen and we'll get going with the lightning presentations. Perfect, thanks Rodrigo. I will be sharing. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Yeah, it looks good. Awesome. Looks thanks Rodrigo for that uh, wonderful introduction. Before I begin, I just want to respectfully acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional uh, territory and Treaty 13 lands of the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. We also recognize the traditional territory of the Huron-Wenda and the Haudenosaunee people, so formerly in the city of Vaughan, uh, which is um, located in the Greater Toronto Area. So today I'm going to be giving a quick uh, lightning talk on the Canadian Coastal Resilience Forum, which is a community practice based out of the University of Waterloo and has been supported by MIOPAR for a number of years now. So who is CCRF? What have we been doing? Well, as I mentioned, we were established in 2018 by Dr. Jason Thistlethwaite and Andrew Manana Goldring and have been operating now for coming up to five years, which is crazy to say now, but um, the in entire uh, COP is focused on building resilience to climate change and natural hazards amongst Canada's coastal regions. And we've done this by coming up with three different goals, uh, which have kind of led the efforts of um, some of the activities and events that we've uh, initiated. So the first one is we've really focused our efforts on clarifying the roles, responsibilities um, across a variety of stakeholders in risk prevention, reduction, and disaster recovery. We're also looking to identify policies in places that actually promote rather than prevent and discourage rebuilding in risky areas, especially after disasters. And we've seen that happen um, across the West and the East Coast. 
And finally, looking at exposed and vulnerable populations and achievable measures of self-protection and risk reduction. So these are some of our guiding practices and principles that have driven our community practice. And we've used this to provide an avenue to gather uh, researchers, governments, and practitioners um, uh, across a variety of different uh, collaborative activities that we've held. And we are uh, contributing our actions set by the United Nations Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. So given that the theme of this year's COP Symposium is looking at some of the successes and lessons learned, um, I figured it'd be good to highlight some of our high level successes that we've had. So the first thing that I wanted to highlight was our cross collaboration and some activities that we've held jointly with another community of practice called the Coastal and Ocean Risk Communication. Um, and I think Cindy will be giving a presentation on that shortly. But uh, recently we held a, we did a joint webinar uh, with the Port COP on um, uh, the Neighborhoods at Risk tool. So we partnered with a U.S. nonprofit called Headwater Economics to showcase our climate adaptation tool. And so we it garnered, garnered a lot of um, insight and applause from people from industry, government, and academics, just because it was a tool that could be easily rec uh, um, not easily, but I think could be replicated in Canada. So I think it provided a lot of insight and great discussion amongst that. And in the past, I think I've just outlined a picture there, but we've partnered with um, organizations such as Delteras, which is based in the Netherlands for a webinar, Fathom, which is based in the UK, a couple of folks from the University of Georgia. So we've really taken an international lens on some of the information that we are trying to um, showcase our um, network as well. Another event that we held was a Coast to Coast to Coast Trivia Challenge, which was really targeted um, to HQPs across the Miopart network. Uh, remember, this was during the height of COVID. So we really wanted to keep in touch with our members. And um, this was a great way of doing that. And uh, it was a kind of sort of trivial activity, but I think it really helped just garner uh, attention amongst the wider network. Um, and, and we did that jointly with the for a uh, court cop as well. Um, we also held our second iteration of the national forum, which was held last May, and we did one previously in 2020. Um, and this required almost a year's worth of planning, but it was a huge uh, virtual conference that was um, available coast to coast. We had over 120 plus participants and speakers from Canada and in and the US who spoke on topics related to disaster recovery lessons, community snapshots, re resilience planning, and coastal resilience uh, challenges across um, different communities, whether or not that's on the East and West Coast. And it really brought together a variety of perspectives. So we saw folks from government talking about the challenges that local governments faced. We saw industry partners talking about um, what was the newest uh, technical work that they were doing, climate modeling and mapping. And we saw folks from academic uh, academia talk about some of their research projects that they had and some of these small scale um, communities as well. And a lot of this work has now informed um, some upcoming research out of the University of Waterloo. So this was a great avenue to, to highlight some of um, those uh, local government initiatives. And uh, if you'd like to learn more about it, I encourage folks to go on the Miopar National Forum website. There is a report that we published as well. So it highlights some high level key findings that I think would be helpful for folks on the line as well. And finally, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't speak about some of the, you know, lessons learned that our community has practice has learned, um, given that we're coming to up to our five year anniversary. But uh, one thing that we've really heavily capitalized on is the use of social media. I think it's been a great conduit to sharing information, um, whether that's resources or events to folks across, um, you know, different organizations. We've really um used uh, and highlighted the efforts of collaboration amongst different organizations. So whether that's partnering on webinars or events, it's really great to not only showcase the work that our community practice is doing, but showcasing the great work that other nonprofits and different organizations are doing. It's really about uplifting each other. Um, so we've, we've really capitalized on that as well. And finally, communities practice, um, we are a hub for resources, whether that's, you know, on our websites, on our YouTube channels, any sort of uh, social media platform out there, we are a hub for resources. And um, I think many folks can come to us and our networks can come to us to capitalize on that and share any up 
upcoming upcoming information. Um, so I'll kind of end off with this nice little quote of learning is continuous um, and communities of practice are often the backbone of that. And so with that, um, I encourage folks, if you'd like to connect with the Canadian Coastal Resilience Forum, we do have a website, we have a Twitter um, handle at Coast Risk Canada, and we um, tweet, uh, I, I would say, pretty regularly. And if you'd like to get in touch with myself, I have my email there. But without further ado, I think that's it for me, but um, we'll take questions at the end, I assume. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. That's great. Megan is next. Thank you so much. Bear with me for just a moment. I got it. I'm... Oh, is it? I think it um, went away. It, it went away. Over. Okay. Yeah. Let me oh, let me try that again. Okay, are we good? Yes, got it, perfect. Fantastic. <clears throat> so good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you're located. I'm Megan Matheson. I am the co-lead of this COP with Dr. Ron Polo, and Ron is also here today. I'm also the Director of Strategy and Innovation for Clear Seas, an independent nonprofit that conducts research to support sustainable marine shipping. I'm speaking today from the traditional lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people, and I want to express my gratitude for their stewardship of these lands and waters since time immemorial. So today I'm just going to run through a little bit about the CMSRF, and <clears throat> uh, apologize for my voice because I'm recovering from a cold and I sound a little bit not like my usual self, so I'm going to do my best. Uh, and touch on briefly why we convene this, this community of practice, what we do, and some of the successes and lessons learned that we've had in the last few years. So we originally launched this community of practice in 2019, and it was a um, joint effort between Neopar and Clear Seas with support from Exact Earth, which is now Spire Maritime. And this COP is intended to be a platform to network and share knowledge around shipping risk and it's open to anyone, people or organizations working in or conducting research on shipping risk. Uh, and we, we see that as both risks from ships and risks to ships. So our community of practice activities resolve around three, revolve around three interest areas, uh, shipping movement data, shipping traffic modeling, and shipping risk assessment and quantification. So broadly, um, this COP addresses challenges related to modeling of ship movement and presence, the impacts of these vessels on the environment and other receptors, and the impacts to vessels from external sources like weather or icebergs or climate change. <clears throat> So when thinking about why to uh, to have this COP in the first place, uh, it was inspired following a workshop that was jointly hosted by Meopar, Clear Seas, and Exact Earth in early 2016 on the topic of better decision-making through maritime traffic monitoring and modeling. The level of interest from the participants in that workshop showed a need for more discussion and collaboration on the topic of shipping risk. So the aims are to look for best practices and also gaps in shipping risk practices and continue discussing with a broad range of people in the field to cross traditional boundaries of knowledge sharing. What exactly do we do? Uh, the CMSRF is, works to convene webinars and workshops and support uh, various working group members in sharing their knowledge, discussing topics of interest and tackling challenges related to managing shipping risk. So what that looks like is uh, a number of webinar series in 2022, we focused on AIS data and how it's used in shipping risk analysis. So we covered four different areas, including how communities use it, how uh, it's being used in the Arctic, how it's being used for research, and just generally what, what AIS data actually is and how it can be used. And we also did a little bit of focus on transboundary risk management um, with a focus on the Salish Sea, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. And we've also had a workshop series. Our first workshop in 2019 was in person, but the ones since then have been virtual. And um, if all goes well, hopefully we'll be able to get back to in-person um, things in the future. 
So to touch briefly on a couple of successes that we've seen as uh, part of this COP, we identified a need, as I mentioned, for the ability to share knowledge. Uh, shipping is very shipping risk is very complex, and there's a lot going on um, across the country from coast to coast to coast. And so we there was no real central resource to support knowledge sharing. Uh, people might be working on a project and not be aware that somebody else had done something similar not very long ago. So the solution that we're proposing is the inventory of shipping risk resources, an online searchable database that anyone can contribute to. So we have a prototype now, um, more than a prototype, it's, it's just about ready to launch. And it is a database that people can go to and search uh, using various filters to help them find material that's most relevant to their interests. And there's also a, a form that people can use to submit their own work, their own projects, their own publications uh, to be able to contribute to the inventory so that they too can be searched and, and found by, by others. So to develop this inventory, we've held a number of workshops uh, to develop the framework and talk about what the parameters would be, uh, come up with a prototype, and then eventually develop the database and, and test out what that looks like. And so now our next step is to launch the database and start populating it and seek out uh, all, the, all the projects that we can to make it a really useful resource for, for everyone working in this, in this area. The other one I wanted to touch on is, um, as, as everyone here I'm sure is well aware, the ocean knows no borders. And so those people who are concerned about the ocean and about shipping and understanding the risks that are inherent to, to shipping and the ocean need to work effectively across these different boundaries as well and sharing knowledge and coordinating their efforts. But that can be a challenge um, given the way that government works, uh, especially governments of different countries. So we came up with the Salish Sea Transboundary Working Group which is a relatively informal gathering place for people to, um, to talk about topics that are pertinent to the Salish Sea and shipping risk. So in 2022, we held a number of meetings um, where the working group, including members from Transport Canada and the Washington Department of Ecology, were able to share their approaches to shipping risk methodology, since each government is currently developing their own uh, approach to understanding shipping risk in that region. And uh, that was a very, very useful um, way for these different governments to be able to really get into how they're approaching developing these methodologies. And additionally, the working group met to discuss lessons learned from a near cross-border oil spill, uh, the sinking of a fishing vessel in the San Juan Islands, which was just, you know, meters kilometers away from the border and the Canadian Coast Guard was involved in the cleanup effort as well as uh, the Washington Ecology Department. So I will wrap it up there. I'm sure there'll be time for questions and discussion, but thank you so much for your attention. And the um, CMSRF has a program page on the Clear Seas website, and you can also contact us at Canadian Marine Shipping Risk at gmail.com. Thanks so much. Wonderful, Megan. Thank you. Ian, uh, you're next. Okay. There we go. All right. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I'm here today representing the uh, Canadian Ocean Mapping Research and Education Network. And uh, I should say that I'm sitting here at uh, the University of New Brunswick uh, and that uh, I respectfully acknowledge that UMB stands on the unsurrendered and unceded traditional Wallisticway land. Uh, so I'd also like to acknowledge my uh, co-lead uh, for this uh, COP, which is Sylvie Danielle uh, from Laval University. So uh, Comran, our, 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 our COP, uh, stretches across the country. We have uh, a lot of different members uh, spread out from coast to coast, from universities, colleges, uh, government uh, institutions, specifically the Canadian Hydrographic Service, is a big part of our our membership, um, and uh, we're starting to get a little bit of uh, of industry involvement. Uh, something we're we're starting to work on more. So, in trying to think of you know sort of the 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 wins or the the things that we're proud of within the within the COP. Um, one of the things I wanted to focus on was uh, how we've been working in, in our education sort of fields uh, and providing opportunities for students. 
Um, and I, I'll reach and I'll touch a little bit on the research outcomes a little bit, but uh, um, I'll, I'll focus more on this side of things. So one of the things that we did that we're pretty proud of is uh, we started a, a summer school, or so we call it the International Hydrographic and Hydrospatial School. And this is a, a week to 10 day course that we do every summer, mostly for graduate students to, to get them up to speed on ocean mapping, sort of fundamental concepts, especially if they're in a, in a tangential field. Um, but it's also open to industry and, and, and so on. And it provides both in-classroom and, and uh, field experience. And the unique thing about this school that we developed, this training school, is that it, it actually involves lecturers from all of the um, Comren organizations. So we bring in basically different lecturers from universities or colleges to speak about their topic of interest or their area of expertise. And we'd weave that together into a, into a program for the students. Uh, the other unique thing about it is it's uh, bilingual. So we offer it in both French and English. Uh, we've done it twice already. We're going to do it again this summer, and this summer we'll have uh, simultaneous translation um, for the for the event. It's also provided online or in person, so it provides a bit more opportunity and uh, it provides some international outreach opportunities for us as well. Uh, we've also been able to uh, sponsor undergraduate and graduate student travel to conferences, uh, which again we're, we've been pretty proud of. It's helped build the network, uh, especially with new people. So we started doing this in 2018 at the Canadian Hydrographic Conference in Victoria. Uh, so Comron enabled the funding, but it came through Department of Fisheries and Oceans uh, and Industry. We did it again in 2020, it was our last conference before the, before the shutdown. We had 28 students at that conference from, uh, again, undergrad and graduate school uh, level students from all over the country. And again, they got to come integrate with it and talk to industry folks, um, academia, and other students to sort of learn about the area and field a lot more. Uh, we were able to do it again in 2020 uh, in Ottawa. Again, had 16 students from across the country come. A lot of them gave presentations at the conference uh, and uh, helped them network for, for job funding opportunities and, and, and so on. And another thing that we did at this conference, which we were pretty proud of, is we uh, hosted what we called the Speed Mapping Challenge, which was sort of a, a hackathon type event for students to form teams and try to solve a real world problem in ocean mapping, which is trying to optimize the production chain for hydrographic uh, nautical charts. So we, they, they had a month to do this. Uh, we had nine teams participating from over five, uh, from five different countries. It was open to international students and the top three teams were given travel to the conference in Ottawa to present the results. And then uh, there was also a prize of five thousand dollars, three thousand dollars, and then two thousand dollars for the for the top three teams. Uh, so that was a really great function, a really great event that we're looking forward to doing again uh, next year at at, our, at the conference. These Canadian Hydrographic conferences happen every two years, so in it varies between Canada and the U.S. So next week we have the U.S. Hydrographic Conference. We have ten students from Comrade institutions going to that conference for presenting. So that'll be a great opportunity again to integrate with their U.S. colleagues and meet some meet uh, the students that are that are traveling there in the industry um, in the U.S. side of things. The other thing we're doing in relation to education, which we're, we're proud of and is a, really a big focus for us right now, is on trying to promote inclusion in, in hydrography or ocean mapping, and specifically trying to um, in, increase uh, equity and diversity in our workforce. Um, so this is a really big uh, interest, a really big interest to the Canadian Graphic Service uh, and industry. So we're working with them to develop lesson plans, go into schools in the, all the way down to the elementary school level, uh, trying to bring our field into the curriculum for schools to try to promote um, uh, promote this uh, as a career path and, and doing that with uh, also doing that directly with Indigenous communities here locally. We've also been able to, thanks to the, the COP funding and the, and the networking, complete and start a whole bunch of really great research programs all across the country, because it's brought together a lot of the expertise at the individual institutions to enable some really interesting, innovative and, and collaborative research. So uh, I'd be happy to answer questions, but if you have uh, any more interest in this, feel free to visit our website, oceanmapping.ca, or, or get in touch with me. Thanks. Thanks, Ian.
lots happening. Uh, it's amazing. I know you guys uh, sort of got going only a, a, a few years ago. Thanks for that. Uh, Cindy, I think you're next. Let me share your screen. Sure, great. Thank you, Rodrigo. Just a second while I get this thing going. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can, Cindy. It's good. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so um, I'm speaking to you today from Victoria, BC, on the unceded lands of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, uh, the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Saanich First Nations, whose ongoing historical relationships with the land continue to this day. And I just want to thank everybody for who was involved in organizing this. It's great to hear about what all the other communities of practice are doing. Um, I think it's well, I think it's a great program. I might be a little biased, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think there's been some really great contributions. Um, so the Coast and Ocean Risk Community uh, Coast and Ocean Risk Communication Community of Practice co-leads are Dr. Joel Finnis uh, from Memorial University of Newfoundland, and I think he's here today and uh, Dr. Rong Pilo from Dalhousie, who's also here, and uh, Dr. Amber Silver, University of Albany, State University of New York. Um, I'm not sure if she was able to join us, but um, yeah, she's also one of the co-leads. So um, let's see if I can get going. <laughs> so with this presentation, um, my goal is to give you a sense of what our community is about and to talk about how our COP has filled a need uh, a needed role at raising awareness and mobilizing knowledge about coastal hazard and risk communication in Canada. Hazards that our community focuses on are mainly related to wind, water, and erosion due to extreme weather events, tsunami, or sea level rise, and their impacts on coastal communities. As we're all well aware, climate change is amplifying and exacerbating, exacerbating many of these coastal hazards. There are many definitions for risk communication, but I'll share one here just, just uh, so that we're, we know what we're sort of talking about. Um, so this one is from Catherine A. McC McComas, 2006, who defines risk communication as the iterative exchange of information among individuals, groups, and institutions related to the assessment, characterization, and management of risk. So I would like to highlight um, three main gaps that our community of practice has helped to address. Um, first, I think there were and still are few, if any, other organizations in Canada that focus on communicating the risk of marine and coastal hazards. With our changing climate and Canada's long coastline, it is vitally important that risks and hazards are not only identified and assessed, but also that we learn how to effectively communicate these risks to support decision making, among end users, emergency managers and planners, government staff who might be developing policy, and researchers tasked with identifying, characterizing, and assessing risk. In the risk assessment process, risk communication is usually acknowledged as important, but is often given less emphasis than hazard or risk identification or characterization or assessment. Yet without effective communication, even well-analyzed risks may not be adequately appreciated or acted upon in time to prevent harm. So in late 2016, MIAPAR leaders and researchers approached a handful of people to gauge their interest in forming a community of practice around coastal and marine risk communication. After forming a steering committee, uh, Court Cop was launched in 2017 and has now grown to over 300 people from 164 organizations representing all levels of government, industry, academia, and nonprofit organizations, and with some international members as well. So I think this leads to the second main contribution I'd like to highlight. In essence, this initiative formed a connected community where none previously existed. And as you can see from the word cloud uh, drawn from members' professional role descriptions, the interests are varied but connected through the common theme of risk communication. Uh, finally, a third challenge that our community of practice addresses is a stubborn and often cited problem in science and policy communities, and that is silos. A key feature of communities of practice is that members are connected by their shared practice and interest in the topic, not by their sector or discipline or professional role. So communities of practice are places where ideas or knowledge can mix and flow, bridging these gaps between the silos. So you can see from the graphs on the slide as well that um, we have robust representation from all sectors 
um, in this community of practice. So the main ways that we mobilize and foster the exchange of knowledge is like the other communities of practice you've heard from. Um, it's mainly now through online presentations, but also in-person events that provide people an opportunity to get together virtually or in person to share ideas, research, and information. So we invite our members to present or attend presentations, and in doing so, they build those connections and knowledge. The community of practice is also flexible, and we're open to trying different ways to support members' interests in collaborative processes. So I'm not going to read all of the um, words on the slide there. I'm not going to repeat them all verbally. But if you just have a, have a look at them, you'll, you can see that um, our community of practice has, um, we've had presentations and discussions about many key topics relating to coastal hazards and risks that Canada faces. And you can find recordings and often the slide presentations for these and other resources on our website. So I think like Shari mentioned, um, our website basically acts as a, a place where you can find these resources and you can find about upcoming events there. You can subscribe to our communi uh, communications lists, et cetera. And we also, um, you can also find us on social media. And so to close, I would just repeat that the coast and ocean risk communication community of practice ad addresses these needed gaps by focusing on coastal hazard and risk communication, something that few or no other groups focus on, despite its increasing impor importance in our climate changing time. And it creates a community for various individuals and organizations across Canada who have interests in this domain, and it addresses the problems posed by siloed sectors and organizations. So to conclude, I'm just going to share a map, a Google map that shows the locations of some of our members. It's interesting to see the geographic reach of our community of practice. And you are welcome to visit our website or subscribe to our communication list and feel free to pitch a presentation topic or a project idea as well. So we gratefully acknowledge Mia Parr, who initiated this community of practice and supported us from 2017 to 2022, and now the Ocean Frontiers Institute, Future Ocean and Coastal Infrastructures, who've supported this community from 2022 to the present. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. That was great. Next, uh, Emmanuel. Turn around. Hello. Uh... Everyone, I'm going about to share my screen here. Uh, you see it? Yes. I do. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning, depending from where you are. I'm here in Jipuktuk, uh, which is a uh, Mi'kma name for Halifax. So, you, I'm uh, just so um, calling in from uh, the NZD territory of the Mi'kma people. And I uh, will be talking about our COP uh, here, our network on coastal ocean and deck uh, optics remote sensing. Uh, that's, uh, as you can see uh, from the images here on the right hand side, that's focusing on uh, optical satellite to, uh, 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 um, to uh, look at uh, water bodies in uh, Canada. So we organized in a steering committee uh, made of uh, five uh, scientists. So we try to respect here gender balance and also geographic uh, location. So we kind of uh, spread uh, all over uh, all over Canada. We do have our very efficient uh, communication and event manager uh, Claudine Wallet, who's here online and. Uh, uh, keeps things uh, moving. And also we had some external uh, advisor, uh, Laurent Jenny from the Canadian Space Agency and uh, Rodrigo here uh, from uh, Mayo Park. Uh, so the goal of our um, uh, COP is mainly was, uh, as everyone else, I suspect in Canada, Canada is a big country. It's not necessarily that sometimes our community are not that numerous. So um, the first idea was to try to uh, have a kind of a common place, a, a forum where we could all, uh, uh, we can meet where scientists can meet students and also try to develop some uh, kind of a center of expertise actually, where we could also um, define the national strategy for ocean color and research. An important point is uh, training of uh, 
of students or high uh, uh, high qualified personnel, but also another was try to democratize a little bit also uh, satellite products. There's a lot of them. Uh, they're not uh, always, people are not always aware of how can they be used. And there was a bit also the goal of, uh, of our um, community of practice. So here I'm going to just uh, try to go uh, quickly over um, uh, the time lapse of uh, activities we have we have done uh, in the past. And you can see first, you will notice that uh, we've heard before that the COPs have been operating for over five years, but actually we started a little bit earlier. Uh, in 2015, actually, um, the Canadian Space Agency wanted to have an interlocutor to uh, deal with uh, issues related to optical satellites in uh, Canada. And under the, actually, at the beginning, funding and advice, we, create, we created uh, the NetColor uh, Network, who's now uh, a COP. Uh, so we get some, uh, we got some uh, kind of a kickoff uh, meeting under CSA. But uh, after two to three years, uh, actually, when uh, CSA was stopping the funding, it was kind of a time we were incorporated into uh, Mayopar and we we're not only able to, uh, I would say, to maintain our activity, but actually to develop them and even, even more just benefiting from Mayopar infrastructure, Mayopar's network, Mayopar experience as well in terms of organization of, uh, of uh, meeting and this type of uh, activities. So again, here I'm not going to go into all, all the details of the activities we have. I'd like to highlight that we had some national uh, workshop, uh, again, funded uh, by uh, Mayopar when we were able to bring like 20 to 25 uh, students plus researcher. Uh, then uh, COVID uh, came like for everyone, but to some extent, it was a bit of a chance in a way that by organizing uh, uh, online, so uh, by March here, we're in 2020, we organized uh, online webinars. There was no way we could travel, but we were able to increase uh, attendance to some extent. You know, we could find maybe uh, 15 uh, students at most, and now we uh, we would uh, have meetings that we would we would try to change a little bit the format, but do uh, two hours a week for a full month, but you could have attendance up to 90, uh, 90 uh, uh, participants. And the fund that was uh, should have been uh, dedicated to travel. Actually, we were able to do prizes and this type of uh, 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 gifts for students, and it just gave them some incentive to participate a little bit more. So, really, a lot of students would give uh, would give talks, which is kind of what uh, we want uh, we wanted. So, following that March online. Uh, uh, workshop, national workshop, we organized subsequent uh, students' webinars. So that was really focused. Uh, students can uh, can uh, just uh, present their work. Uh, and I think that was getting feedback was something that I really appreciated. Also, um, sometimes bridge between uh, students who do the similar research in different, uh, different places. Uh, we got also some of the... Uh, we would focus on in some reports that thought would be interesting either to the ocean color or the ocean color community, but also to the wider wider scientific audience. So in terms of, so here's our just summary of the a bit the last eight years of what we've been doing. And the highlights, of course, uh, I think it's a bit similar to what we've seen so far. What is was important is to have a forum where we can discuss. And I think, again, it's... Uh, I find it so interesting as a researcher where we can already meet students even from other part of Canada where sometimes they read your paper and they might be a little bit, uh, I'd say, uh, uh, not say shy, but they have a hard time to go and talk to you when you would have this meeting on this poster session and everyone was talking was really uh, breaking the ice and that was very, uh, very, uh, very interesting. So that was with this national uh, workshop. Like currently, uh, NetColor has 140 members. And when we had our workshop, again, when it was face to face, about 40 to 50 people, but you could see the participation uh, really increasing uh, when you are moving uh, online. Uh, we published one uh, report. So it's about what we consider being there was a scientific. Uh, priorities that uh, Ocean Color could uh, help uh, addressing in Canada that was published in 2019. And you have a second one that is uh, in uh, preparation. Uh, this time, um, we are actually 
uh, one of the we can later we'll be discussing about challenges. Sometimes it's uh, we all uh, most of us are uh, uh, doing that. Uh, oh, I lost my vocabulary. Sorry, um, uh, doing an app, not free time, but as a volunteer. So things are a bit slower sometimes that you really would like, and that's. Uh, uh, report actually what we're thinking it's actually in the coming weeks gonna post chapter after chapter on the Netcrawler website that's advertised below here. Uh, one of the things a big success is that uh, with the support of Meopar we were able to maintain again an increase uh, uh, Netcrawler's presence and Netcrawler's activities and uh, actually the Canadian Space Agency is considering and working on uh, having a Netcrawler's uh, advisory group for all uh, ocean crawl related issues so that's uh, that's a big uh, victory. Uh, the presence of, of on social media so with international followers uh, it's uh, mainly Claudine who's like tweet news about Meopar or news about ocean crawl so it's kind of those two walls that kind of meet and actually we promote, promote each other. So um, here it looks like we're on track and we want uh, this have a solid foundation to uh, keep uh, Netcrawler um, uh, working and uh, being active. Really what we kind of start to see now is how our community, so our community gets really uh, more um, open to each other, like stronger, but nothing is the next cycle, but we're really looking at it's open to open to the wide audience, open to the end users, and how we can really have that uh, 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 colleagues having uh, benefits from uh, this uh, satellite products of Earth observation. So that's it uh, for, for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Austin, if you are ready, we're running just a little bit behind. That's uh, normal. So we'll just try and get through the next uh, couple of presentations and then move on to a um, good discussion and, and, and question period. Perfect. Uh, can everyone see and hear, see my screen and hear me? Yes. Excellent. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Austin Pugh, and I'm the coordinator for Canada's Ocean Acidification Community of Practice. And today I'm speaking to you all from the traditional territories of the South Nation in on Southern Vancouver Island. Uh, and today I'm going to give a quick overview of some of the success stories of the ocean acidification community of practice. Uh, before I get into that, I just wanted to quickly cover uh, some of our overarching goals so you know who we are and why we classify some of these activities as success story. Uh, number one, our first goal is to coordinate across all six sectors, disciplines, and to share expertise and data with regard to OA all across Canada, as some of uh, my colleagues from other COPs have mentioned, siloing can be a very difficult issue to overcome, and that's what that goal aims to break. Uh, we also try to identify pressing needs for OA research and knowledge, specifically in terms of knowledge gaps and technological gaps, identifying those and giving direction to the ocean acidification community in Canada to drive future research. And finally, to create a collaborative and supportive environment for groups affected by ocean acidification uh, and create that platform for discussion where absolutely everyone's welcome. Jumping right into some of our activities, I wanted to give kind of a broad activity that showcases why not only the ocean acidification community of practice, but all community pra practices are useful. And that is what happened uh, when the world shut down into quarantine during COVID, I think this is a really good example of when a community of practice can shine and uh, show its work. Because when we have these unpredictable events that affect every day to day life, having a body of people that are delegated to thinking about how community uh, can move forward with ideas and practices and events is really important. The way that we went about it as the OACOP was we set ourselves a uh, goal to increase online engagement and to build accessible resources for the new uh, way that we were living in a COVID world. And we did this by adapting our virtual resources to focus on blog posts, discussion posts, creating uh, web resources like our map of Canada's OA resources, which is an interactive map that you can go in and see all of the projects across Canada laid out as well as increasing our social media presence. 
And as an outcome of this, we saw a steady increase in members and followers on all of our social medias, as well as our email list, as well as a continuation and growth of the conversation around ocean acidification, despite everything being shut down and in-person meetings not being available. And finally, we did focus quite a bit of our promotion on early career researchers, which we decided uh, we figured were hit more hard than a lot of other groups due to the lack of opportunities for them to go to in-person meetings and promote their own research. And I think this is just a wonderful example of where communities of practice can shine. Uh, one of our ongoing uh, success stories is the state of ocean acidification knowledge in Kendo white paper, which is a paper that we're putting together with the goal of giving a high level overview of ocean acidification knowledge and identification of those knowledge gaps across three major areas, biology, monitoring, and modeling, that will recommend future actions for decision makers. And we went about this by bringing together teams of experts to discuss and compile known da data, as well as write different sections of the paper, and to create a big central figure which links to a live interactive resource, which is currently being developed, which, can be got, which we can go back to in the future. Some of the outcomes of this uh, will give future directions to researchers and decision makers, going back to that second goal of the community of practice, as well as creating that interactive map that can be used into the future by anybody uh, as it's free online. And this is the first time that this type of paper has been written and created in Canada. So it's this big success story that we can hope will, once it's published in the next couple of months, be used to motivate future action in Canada. Uh, the third and final uh, activity I'd like to talk about today is our promotion of the Department of Fisheries and Oceans and National Ocean and Atmospheric Association's Ocean Acidification Collaboration, which is an absolute mouthful, but it breaks down into a pretty nice acronym. Uh, and the goal of our promotion is to promote the work of this group as before we uh, were taken on to help promote the research projects and collaborations coming out of this group. Uh, not too many people were aware of it, or if they were, they weren't 100% sure what exactly was going on within the group. And our activities were the creation of a communication plan, which can be used in the future if the group would like, as well as creating summary cards and highlights for each of the research projects coming out of the group, and creating resource packages that are regionally specific. And some of the outcomes uh, that are specific to our Canadian members are promoting Canadian research, not only on the national stage, which we are quite accustomed to, but across an international audience through the US and beyond with uh, the new partnerships we formed through this collaboration, as well as highlighting many, an example of an international bilateral collaboration that's successful. They're difficult to do, but I think it's important to highlight success stories to promote future uh, research in this in this vein. Uh, with that, those are the three quick and dirty overviews of three of our success stories. I'd like to, like everyone else, invite you to join our network and all of the information on our uh, on our community of practice you can see on screen. Thank you very much. Thanks, Austin. And last but not least, uh, I think Richard will uh, be presenting on behalf of Ocean Gliders. Awesome, I can see that. Perhaps I should unmute, what do you think? Yes, unmute would be good. And maybe if you can put it on presentation mode, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm working on that too, there we go. <laughs> Thanks. All right, here we go. Everything good now? Man, wouldn't it be great when we don't have to worry about this stuff anymore? That'll be the day. So yeah, I'm Richard Davis. I'm at Dalhousie University. I am not Brad DeYoung, who is on the West Coast. Uh, Rodrigo and Emmanuel did a lovely job with the land acknowledgement and much better than I have. So in the interest of catching up a little bit, let's move on. Uh, I am going to speak to you about Ocean Gliders Canada, a community of practice uh, that was funded by MIAPAR and is now also supported by the Ocean Frontier Institute and the Ocean Tracking Network. Uh, it's a consortium of glider users um, that span all the way from Newfoundland to Vancouver Island, uh, but we are not 
uh, in exclusive. We will allow anybody to join, whether you're not a glider operator or not Canadian. Um, we were formed in 2014 at the MIAPAR Annual Science Meeting in Montreal that year. And we have very simple and defined goals. We want to um, develop some commerce standards to support data quality, and that's not just quality control and quality assurance. That's developing pipelines that go right from hardware to the, to the computer so that everybody is, uh, data sets become more interoperable. We share best practices and we support new users. In fact, even as I speak, we have two people here being trained in our group. Uh, and, and as part of this uh, supporting the new user, users, we have websites, uh, we have workshops, and we have uh, in-person training. Uh, one of the very first things we did uh, was we developed a national sharing of resources, kind of like a yellow pages of what was available out there so that if you were coming to the East Coast, you knew that we had uh, a certain uh, level of infrastructure that we could support you with. But we also share code and ideas. And last but not least, we uh, encourage coordination between operators so that uh, we actually know what missions are gonna happen before they happen and uh, that we can reduce overlap and, and uh, maximize the number of stakeholders being engaged. Uh, now, perhaps not everybody here knows what a glider is. So I'm gonna give a very quick overview. So these are buoyancy driven gliders. Uh, they move up and down to the water column by changing their volume, which in turn changes their density, which causes them to rise and sink. They have wings that provide lift, just like an aircraft. Um, they're persistent. They can be out for uh, up to four months at a time and travel thousands of kilometers. They're very efficient because basically they're just moving a piston to change their volume. Uh, the downside to that is they are quite slow. Our nominal horizontal speed is roughly a kilometer per hour. Uh, and they can go down to as deep as a thousand meters. Uh, contrary to what the manufacturers tell you, they are not plug and play. They are quite complex pieces of equipment. And since they cost close to half a million dollars each, uh, you want to have some assurances that you have done everything you can to make sure your glider successfully completes its mission and you're able to recover it. So that is a goal of Ocean Gliders Canada to help provide that assurance. So the, here's a, just a map of the glider activities on the West Coast and the East Coast. Um, these, the Eastern operations have been going a little bit longer. We've been active since 2010. So there's a few more mission tracks there. Um, we have now flown uh, greater than 160,000 kilometers. I love to brag about that. So we are now four times around the world at roughly a kilometer per hour. So uh, not only are we fantastic scientists, we are exceedingly patient people. So, um, but uh, one of the things you might notice is there's two separate maps here. I had to ding our West Coast people to send me a map. Wouldn't it be great if you could go to one spot and see all the missions in Canada? And you in fact can do that. So if you go to the Ocean Gliders Canada website, you can see all of the glider missions in Canada. We now scrape that data automatically from the various operators servers and it gets displayed at the end of a mission. Um, what you cannot do is say, man, there was a mission in a place that I'm interested in. I would love to see that data because the data is not all in one place. So our first success that I would like to highlight is that we have now developed a data repository, the Ocean Glider Data Assembly Center. And this, uh, was a lot of people involved in this. This is not something that's easy to do, including the uh, Canadian Integrated Ocean Observing System, uh, MIAPAR, the Ocean Frontier Institute, OTN, Dalhousie Memorial, and the Hakai Institute on, on the West Coast. It is in a beta stage, it is being tested. The operators are throwing data sets at it to see if we can break it. They are succeeding, uh, but we're almost there. Uh, I think we just have to get our metadata compliance checker up and running and then we'll be good. This is huge. Uh, the US IUS has had theirs up and running for several years. We are now catching up to them partially because we stole their infrastructure from them. Um, one of the other things we do is we develop and share best practices. We have very active Slack channel and GitHub code repository. So people are communicating, asking questions and sharing their code. Uh, we have submitted a paper to Frontiers of Marine Science uh, from the East Coast where we shared our best practices. 
And we have another manuscript in prep to submit to the Journal of Ocean Technology, which should come out later this year. And finally, Ocean Gliders Canada provides a link to international programs such as the Underwater Glider User Group in the US and Ocean Gliders Internationally. We have members of Ocean Glider Canada on both of their um, steering committees. So some of the challenges, no surprise there, COVID was a, uh, yeah, created some operational barriers for field program. And of course we have not met in person as everybody has pointed out here. Um, another challenge that we have is the Canadian glider groups are small in number and, and relatively geographically isolated. Uh, so we do need to have some sort of virtual means of communicating with each other. And it would be nice if we could see each other a little more often uh, so that we don't feel quite so isolated. Uh, I, I won't use the term siloed just because everybody else is using it. I want to be different. So, uh, and each group has its own strengths and weaknesses. Uh, and it's the, of course, the academic programs conducting research and governmental partners who are uh, doing monitoring efforts. We have different mandates and we operate in very different fashions. And it is sometimes hard to coordinate missions. So that's a hurdle we haven't quite got over yet, but we are working on it. And of course, co coordinating internationally uh, faces some of the same challenges that we have just coordinating nationally. So uh, resource needs, no surprise, we need money. Uh, one of our critical needs is to have a dedicated person to manage the, the, um, this, co uh, this community of practice. I mean, Brad and I have been doing it, but we, we have other day jobs. Uh, this would not be a full-time position, but we do need somebody to kind of make sure that we're uh, getting everything done. And, and it would be great, of course, if we could have more in-person meeting uh, support for digital infrastructure, which right now OFI and OTN are providing, but it's not a line item in their budgets and, and software development, such as a metadata tracking system that we've developed. And of course, we need to have strong interagency support from the various institutions and partners. So finally, our vision for uh, Ocean Gliders Canada, of course, more money. Uh, we'd, we'd love to see a sustained nationally integrated ocean observing system, right? And gliders can be a huge part of that. They're persistent, they're in the ocean for months at a time and they're out there in all weather. They do not replace research vessels. They are just another tool in the toolbox. Uh, but uh, we like to think of them as uh, pickup trucks and you can strap pretty much any sensor you want on there. And it's a great way to connect, uh, collect data in places you probably don't want to be in winter. Uh, we'd love to see a link and fully sustainable CUs program so that uh, all oceanographic data, not just the gliders, has a single point of entry. And finally, uh, we'd like to see the community of practices across the country work together to help support this integrated national and international observing system, such as the nascent North Atlantic Carbon Observatory. Uh, I did not put my email on, address on here, but uh, it's just richard.davis.dow.ca. And with that, I thank you. Thank you, Richard. One of the really well-established clubs. Uh, it's great to see all that work. So everyone, uh, we're gonna just move uh, on to our question period. I, I'll probably ask uh, all the presenters if they wanna turn on their video, if possible. That way we can start to field some questions. Um, if we have any from uh, the audience in the chat, if not, we do have some sort of questions to kind of get the conversation going. And I might put them out there. If we don't have anything um, from the audience just yet, great. Okay. So some of this has perhaps been addressed in um, some of these presentations. We definitely saw a lot of similar similarities across the board uh, on, on the way that the COBs are using different methods to bring the community together. Uh, one thing we maybe want to uh, add about or hear more about is how does your COB contribute to the larger coastal and ocean community? And how do you think uh, Canadians and Canada's coastal and ocean spaces benefit from your COB? If someone wanted to kind of address that a little bit, talk about the benefits and bringing uh, that broader ocean community together. I can call on Sunday <laughs> if everybody's shy. 
Well, I can I can break the ice here. <laughs> um, but um, I think that this question, I, I think um, from our perspective, I, I did I touched on it obviously in our in our presentation. Um, but I think the the fact that um, these communities of practice, not just ours, but all of them do bring together people um, that are that represent all the different sectors. And that is really something that's um, unusual. And I know that when we hold our events, and I don't mean just our our events from the community of practice, the Coast and Ocean Risk Communication Community of Practice, but we also collaborate with the other communities of practice, as Shiree mentioned, a couple that we partnered there and also our community practice has also worked with the Canadian uh, the, the shipping risk um, community practice as well CMSRF and and um, so that basically that that broad um, connections and relationships are built because of that because the communities of practice do bring together the people across sectors across disciplines focused on that the topic of the community and then we can branch out among our communities and connect with each other as well and i think that all of us kind of work work that way towards towards that so i think that's <clears throat> i think that's one of the key contributions that i see these communities of practice offering i agree <clears throat> thanks uh cindy richard yeah sure so the question was you know how, how are we benefiting coastal communities um one um, project that we are deeply involved in is monitoring the North Atlantic right well. We have gliders out with hydrophones that report back in real time, and we are now part of the dynamic management scheme of both DFO and Transport Canada uh, to uh, mitigate right well mortality by either in invoking ship slowdowns or uh, fishery closures. In the early days, back when uh, in the summer, what is it, 2017, when uh, 19 something whales died? Uh, you know, they were just doing blanket ship slowdown and uh, fishing bans, and, and now they're targeted, right? So now they have, uh, they're not shutting down entire industries, which, uh, you know, saves a lot of money and saves livelihoods. And where o Ocean Gliders Canada helped with that is we, we've been coordinating with DFO because they are now deploying their own gliders, right? And so we can talk directly and we can say, okay, you're here, we're going to go there. And uh, it's a great benefit, I think, to Canada and to those communities. And, and so far, they have not shot one of our gliders. So I guess they, they agree with that. So, Yeah, that's a great example. Thank you. Sherry? Um, sure, let me just lower my hand. I think that's a little distracting. Um, OK, great. So I wanted to highlight two points here. Um, uh, kind of to follow up with Cindy's point, communities of practice, I think, are a great conduit to connect these different stakeholders. Otherwise, they wouldn't really have the opportunity or the chance to do so. And so I wanted to highlight something that I spoke about was a national forum. Um, and we had sessions on local community snapshots. So we really uh, invited coastal communities to talk about some of the challenges that their communities faced, whether that was in, you know, resources or the capacity issues that they faced. And, and that was a really good avenue for communities that might not have had the chance on a bigger platform to share um, and transfer some of those um, knowledge, knowledge and lessons with other larger communities. Because often you hear, um, you know, the successes of big communities and big cities like Vancouver, Toronto, um, you know, Halifax, but you don't really necessarily to, uh, get to hear about what's happening in these small towns. So I think um, raising the platform for these smaller communities was a great opportunity through the National Forum. Um, and secondary, I wanted to comment or highlight, um, we had hosted a webinar a couple, uh, maybe a year or two years back uh, with Fathom. And after the fact, um, a lot of coastal communities, you know, reached out to us and said, hey, this was a great uh, webinar. Um, you know, we'd love to do this type of flood modeling work in our community, we just don't have the capacity. So it was really a great handoff to, um, you know, invite uh, these communities to work with, you know, potential uh, companies out there, or industry partners on some of these things that they might not have capacity to do so. And so I think we, as communities of practice, are kind of the gateway for that. Um, and, and we should continue to do so as well. Thanks. Ah, thank you. Ian, do you want to go next? Yeah, I, I I think my thoughts on this are probably similar to everybody else's, but, uh, you know, what we found in our area of ocean mapping is that uh, 
we had expertise spread out across the country at uh, individual institutions and there was sort of you know one person in one spot doing one thing and somebody else in another spot doing another thing and it just kind of it meant that uh, there was no central spot for uh, anybody to look for help or to look for collaboration opportunities or anything like that and now with the community of practice it, it's it it centralizes that in a way and it brings together not competing interests but collective interests that it can actually work together to provide something sort of a, a greater good and what we're seeing is it's now it's now the point of contact for somebody who wants to talk about ocean mapping in Canada. I mean, we, we had somebody reach out from the from the Maldives uh, just randomly because they found our website and they wanted to talk about how uh, ocean mapping impacts climate models and impacts uh, flooding and, um, and 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 things like that. So it was a really interesting. It was a nice sort of accomplishment or nice success story for the for the COP and that they didn't just look up oh Ian at UMB they looked at Comran as a Canadian expert area of expertise yeah uh, thanks for thank you for sharing that yeah that's that's good Austin yeah my comment it's going to echo Ian's a little bit but as our community practice, and I'm certain the other ones as well, as we get established, I find that our activities are moving more from internal Canada to uh, connecting Canada with external international organizations and members, which is a really interesting and exciting uh, uh, field that we're, we're expanding into. And I didn't get to include it in this presentation because it was just a lightning round. And I'm certain all the other communities of practice could also make this figure, but we do have a slide that we sometimes use that's us at the middle with all spokes going out like a wheel that show all the connections and how we act as that central hub to both national and international organizations. And when a project partner approaches us and asks for uh, someone that can be an expertise in OA policy law, we can then point them in the right direction. It doesn't matter where that person is in the world because we've we have those established relationships already and yeah it's very interesting and as we move into the forward uh, into the future it seems to only be getting stronger those relationships thank you no thank you i think it's interesting and you can see how uh, the communities of practice and in the experience we have here act as that aggregator role and then be able to connect uh, with others and also seem to uh, in Sherry's uh, examples, they seem to sort of feel approachable by perhaps groups like uh, community groups uh, and, and create that gateway gateway to sort of the research, academia, industry sectors, and so forth. Um, Sydney, uh, Cindy, I know you have your hand up, but I was going to move on to another question, if you don't mind. No, that's uh, that's fine. Yeah, I'll I'll highlight what I was going to say somewhere else. <laughs> yes, thank you. I think there's there's a, a an interesting question. Um, that we wanted to sort of hear from everyone was on the do's and don'ts of setting up and maintaining a community of practice, uh, some of the benefits and drawbacks and ideas for improvement and changes. I think from your part perspective, we've seen how communities of practice have grown and we've also tried to adapt our program to try and meet some of those needs. We know that obviously, like Richard mentioned, funding support is key. But uh, perhaps in your experience, uh, some of you can share some of the do's and don'ts and, and what has worked uh, for you. Just because we also know that there's a lot of other uh, uh, participants that are interested in just perhaps creating or, or developing their own communities of practice. So I wanna hear about this lessons learned and examples. You wanna go next, uh, Ian? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I, uh, I don't know if it's a do or don't, but it may be a challenge that we faced. Um, and I'm looking forward to learning more about how to do it right is, uh, you know, as as a as a community that's mostly been um, academic institutions, uh, even you know across a few different types of academic institutions, but still academic institutions, we found it pretty natural to collaborate and to uh, discuss things amongst ourselves. But uh, we've been having trouble figuring out how to meaningfully expand out into first industry. We're figuring that out now, uh, and how to figure and how to do that, but also into the broader community um, of just interested peoples. 
um, because it kind of changes the way that we're used to discussing things about you know students or education opportunities or research projects or research proposals it kind of it, it reframes the conversation a bit so while we i think we've been pretty successful in academic collaborative building one of the things we are looking forward to doing next is building outside of that academic network and looking at ways to to do that so i'm looking forward to hearing from and talking to some of the other cops to see ways that they've accomplished that that's a good point uh interesting point to to discuss we're you know sort of meant to kind of bring different sectors together but we do know that there's always a, a strong sort of academic participation and focus on a lot of our communities of practice so it's good to kind of keep that in mind always of how to continue to expand um, the collaborations austin i think had a hand up next yeah and i just want to say ian that we also face similar issues so <laughs> if any of us figure it out please share the secret <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, one thing I wanted to highlight, and I know that a lot of our presentations mention social media and the creation of content for that, which is a forever treadmill that we're trying to stay on top of. And a little tip, a little, a little do and don't I've discovered in my time creating all that is that there's a large difference in engagement between passive and active engagement. Uh, when you put it out into the world. So active engagement is something like a survey or a poll or a discussion post asking the community members to do something now versus passive is a blog article that you click on and you read in your own time. And what I've discovered is uh, those passive engagements do much, much better. They get more clicks, more views, and down the line, someone may come up to you and mention one of those, those engagements where, it seems as if online, at least, many, many communities tend to stay away from those active engagements just uh, because we're not big enough groups to really facilitate these large conversations that are really quick. And uh, that's just one thing that I've, I've learned over my time as the coordinator. <laughs> that's, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that uh, type of approach on social media. It's good that you guys are keeping kind of track uh, eyes on that and kind of seeing what works uh, for you. Uh, Emmanuel? Yeah, um, uh, one of uh, the do's, uh, more on my, uh, my experience, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's just to say it in brief, have someone that can dedicate time to the COPs and it's what happened. I'm going to like upload again, uh, Claudine, who's been working, it was only a day a week or sometimes two days a week, depending on the activities. But you, if you think that you can have a COP that you're going to manage uh, on your own and uh, do the tweeting, organize conferences, uh, respond to mail power, you know, specific calls and things like that. And it's been really, it's something that's really helped in terms of uh, updating the website, uh, circulating information among the member organizing. So I think that's something that's really uh, gave us opportunity to achieve all what we have uh, achieved uh, because we did have someone that could really de dedicate time uh, to it and push us as well. Like she sends reminders, say like, don't forget, like, we have that meeting in a week and this should be done by then. And she goes and bugs people and it's what we need. And the other thing, it's really uh, uh, because often it's managed by uh, academics or you know or government, it's to engage students as much as we can. And uh, every uh, in in terms of when we would have some activities, a report or uh, organize a, a workshop, it's to have students right away uh, in the organization get the ideas and also contract them sometime for editing uh, some documents or thing like that. And I think that it's it was kind of uh, nice when we had that mix of uh, students and more uh, experienced uh, scientists. And I think that's also what trains the students for the, uh, the coming years after. So it's kind of to do's in yeah. terms of don't, I said, don't commit too much to big reports or big undertakings that, uh, for example, that report number two, I have to acknowledge it, we're a bit slow on it. You know, it's been in the burner for like two to three years. It's just because everyone is busy. We try, we have meeting on a regular basis and things like that. That was a big coming mat. We will, uh, 
finish it. We might in the future do some, again, some type of activities like a written activity, like it, it, which leave a, a, better, a better record. But uh, we, we might be more prepared or find another way to, to move it faster. Yeah, no, good point. It, it, it takes a lot of work to move these things forward and to coordinate those efforts and bring community together. So definitely something we've seen and recognized over the years. Um, Cindy? Yeah, I think um, before I get into my bill, I'll just uh, address or maybe have a comment about like Ian and I think it was someone else who wondered about how to reach out beyond the academic circles and try to engage more community uh, members and um, I don't really have an answer but I could give you a couple of things that we've done that um, that I guess have been successful that way um, and it, and I think what happened was our, our community of practice or particularly our, our sort of admin team uh, myself and our leads um, kind of act as connectors and um, so for example um, Ryan Reynolds one of the Neopar researchers um, had an uh, an idea for an application so research based um, Thing that start it started as a research sort of project, and it was a, a mobile application, and he wanted to develop it to help communities um, prepare for um, disasters. So um, he was one of our community of practice members. He still is, and um, so what I said, well, you know what, I can reach out to the the emergency managers and local government representatives that we do have listed in our community of practice. They, you know, they've come to some of our events and just see if they'd be interested in piloting your project and in their communities. And so I did, and and indeed it worked. He's, you know, he's he managed to have like I think there's six or seven communities on Vancouver Island now that are working with him to develop this. So in that respect, we we just acted kind of as a connector. And something similar also with the National Forum. I know Shiree mentioned with her, their community of practice and ours were, um, we reached out to our community members to see if they would be interested in presenting at the forum. And because we have, we have members in our community of practice who are from local government, because we've selected engagement activities and topics earlier that it that they were interested in. So we had researchers present topics that they were interested in. They joined our community of practice. And then we say, hey, you know, would you be interested in participating in this one, this event as a presenter? So it sort of takes time, but as you develop those relationships with your, you know, with the members of your community of practice across sectors, you can start to see the, um, you know, the collaboration building up. And, um, but anyway, um, I guess one thing that I would have as a don't is uh, don't overwhelm people. You know, the timing and quantity of information and events, um, you know, it's so we're all so overwhelmed with everything these days, especially online stuff. You know, COVID has been both a, you know, it's helped people get used to Zoom, but at the same time, we all kind of maybe hate Zoom. <laughs> We're all looking forward to in-person stuff. But but it's not just the online stuff. It's so just be careful about your timing and quantity of, of stuff that you're sharing with your members, because at some point they'll just go, you know what, this is really interesting stuff, but I have too much on my desk right now. Click, you know, I'm I'm done with this, you know. And so, yeah, you just sort of have to be really careful about that. But anyway, that's, I think, I think that's all for now. The delicate <laughs> balance, uh, yeah. Cindy, yeah, yeah. No, right. Mm -hmm. So thanks for those examples. Cherie, we're going to move on to, an, to a, another question because we do have a little exercise where we want to ask the audience for uh, their feedback. So there's a, there's a question and, uh, and a SWOT board that we're going to share uh, the link to so that sort of hopefully the audience can kind of put their thoughts there. But it's basically about asking everybody here, how has uh, participation in the co-op uh, helped your work and how can that be improved? If you can just take a few minutes uh, and join uh, join us uh, on, the, on the whiteboard. Do we have the link uh, that we can share with everyone here so they can get online? Yep, just give me one second, Rodrigo. Yeah, that'll be great. And I know that there's also a comment uh, in the chat that maybe I'll ask some of the uh, co-op um, presenters to look at. Uh, it's about sort of trying to connect with the different co-ops and um, 
given the limited the, the limited capacities that everybody has that Cindy was sort of alluding to as well. So if you could just take a minute, maybe there's something that you can reply. Um, Both and, I will, um, the, I can see that Isa has informed me, you can see this, but you need a link. So I'm just looking yeah. for the link right now. My apologies. Oh, sorry. It's in the uh, script. In the, um, document. the head of the script. At the, oh, of, of course, at the head of the script. I have it here. No, I got it. That's fine. Thanks, Isa. Thank you. Sorry, everybody. Yeah, so if, if people here in our audience have, are part of the co-ops, have participated in co-ops, or maybe even just joined some of the co-op uh, meetings, uh, webinars, workshops, if you can just uh, speak to that, take a few moments um, and help us sort of maybe fill that SWOT uh, analysis on what are some of the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities and threats that you would like to kind of see. Oh, cool. See some people are already in there. Bridget, I don't know if other people are in the same situation, but for me, it, I'm logged in, but it says I have to request access. Ah, okay. Oh, dokie, give me one more minute. But I see other people are fine. Okay. So. Yeah, I see that folks are messaging me in the chat, so I will try and troubleshoot this from the back end. Yeah, it works for some, but not for others. Weird. I'm always challenged by these things. Once we've grabbed something, Rodrigo, where do we put it? Good question. I think you can drag it, right? Yeah, but where to? Well, it depends. If it's a strength of the cops, a weakness, an opportunity, or a threat, I think we want to try and uh, look at it that way. Ah, OK, thank you. <clears throat> Someone says here that it might be something to do with my version of Zoom. Um, so maybe we need, some people need to. Uh, I, I don't know if, yeah, I tried connecting outside of Zoom and I still couldn't connect. So I'm oh, not sure this okay. is Zoom. Mind you, that could be another problem. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, well, mm -hmm. maybe we can kind of move on to some other questions. If it's not working for everybody, it may not. Uh... We can still collect this, and as I understand it, the whiteboard and the link can be active beyond the meeting. So, you know, we can still kind of send it around perhaps after we troubleshoot it, and people can do it on their own time a little later uh, after the meeting. Oh, hold on one second. Can folks try this link? I'm not sure if it's the same one, but those of you who are having issues, can you click on that? That says it's the, the access link. I'm going to try it too. Thanks, Bridget. Did that work? No, not for you, Cindy. I uh, know. And that one, I'm just playing with the, <laughs> <laughs> the settings. We've never used whiteboards. I thought we had used everything in Zoom. Well, some people are in there. Yeah, it's so yeah. strange. Yeah. Okay. Well, Maybe there's a couple more questions and that are kind of important as well with regards to sort of the future of COPS and we can kind of maybe try and continue with those those and uh, and see if we can resolve this and then resend the link later to participants. We are getting yeah we're getting some input. Can can we uh, sort of stop sharing and then maybe have uh, move on to a couple other questions? And if we see, we can bring that up later if we see that uh, that it works. Thank you. So I think we some of you alluded to this, but obviously you know the long term sustainability of communities of practice it's a challenge. And so perhaps maybe just trying to talk about what are some of the barriers that threaten that long term sustainability. And we know that. Uh, Funding is one of them, but perhaps are, there's others. Oh, Doug, Doug, you had a, your hand up. Yeah, actually, I had a question. Am I allowed to a quick question there, Rodrigo? Just uh, 
Yeah. Why don't you do that? Yeah, let's do it. Because I, I mean, I, I picked up on, I think it was Austin's comment about how uh, the ocean acidification community practice allowed Canada kind of diverse uh, researchers across Canada to connect internationally and vice versa. And I'm just wondering from some of the other areas where of the COPs, if there wasn't a COP, right? If we didn't have a COP, how would Canadians typically participate in international in internationally relevant activities? Would there? Are there other op I mean, really, are there other mechanisms for coordinating a Canadian kind of voice or getting information to and from Canada to related issues uh, internationally? I just wonder how important that role is, basically, or could be for uh, for the cops from a national perspective. It's a long question. Sorry about that. So I don't know for, for other cops. I mean, I think Austin made it pretty clear for ocean acidification. Ian, are you do you have a, a response to that? Or yeah, well, just I know just from our experience, um, what uh, what we found is that you know before we had this group, it was always just one person at some institution would know about some opportunity or something and would connect and then they would maybe distribute that to their peers and you know the traditional kind of one person um doing that and just hope that others can hear about it and it it just wrote it really was not effective um i think one of the challenges we're we're seeing is how do we how do we present our cop group internationally so like if we if we go to an international event or some sort of a you know a funding opportunity or an organization how do we explain what we are because it's almost it's often confusing to say you know this is a it's not it's not necessarily it's not led by one institution it's sort of a collegial group of people who are kind of working together but then that they're like well what does that mean how do i how do i interact with that and then it, but anyway it's it's i think it's it's getting there i think it's one of the things we're trying to solve is what that what do what is our group how do we represent ourselves but now we have one face to kind of go out to the world and say here's here's what's happening in canada in this space which is really powerful Thanks again. Uh, I see Jonathan has his hand up to, as well. It's, I mean, as a new thing, uh, the community of champions for the ocean decade uh, across the country is another way in which we're communicating internationally. I think that's going, it's not really well established yet, but I think it has potential to be another interface uh, for Canadian researchers to, inter, uh, to interact with internationally. And there was a question actually uh, in the chat uh, about that, about how um, could co-ops in place support growing the Canadian contribution to the ocean decade? And it's from uh, Mirella, uh, the Orca Secretariat. So thanks for uh, kind of bringing that up as well. Uh, Emmanuel, did you have your hand yeah. up? Uh, yeah, um, just to uh, build up on the international uh, side of the COPs for us, it's uh, interesting. It's a bit of a different, uh, a story in terms of the, an international community of practice like create, was created in the mid-90s exactly with kind of a similar tech scientist uh, together. It's called the IOCCG International Ocean Coordinating Group. And uh, we kind of almost copy that uh, model with avoiding uh, doubling his work. And uh, some of the some other countries have tried as well, actually, to have those national uh, working work. France had one who kind of fell apart. I think Australia is putting one together. So I think for us, it's kind of interesting that that international kind of not partner, but there's an, an international uh, venue where you can voice. And when you have uh, this IUCCG uh, meeting, actually, the Canadian Space Agency is going to update on net colors activity. And I think it's uh, that's kind of uh, an interesting uh, Kind of different model, but uh, as interesting. But for us, it was really we don't we do have some international activities, and I think, for example, we could uh, when we we going to respond to calls, for example, for the space agencies and put the Canadian together. 
Uh, we have also uh, initially um, starting some collaboration with uh, Australia, but our focus is really Canada. Uh, and that's the way we're just kind of operating, but we... Good, thanks. Thanks for sharing, Doug. Um, I don't know if that answers your question a little bit, but also I don't know, Doug, if you have any comments on the question in the chat about the, the potential role that the COPS in place could uh, play in helping to support the growing um, the Canadian contribution to the ocean decade. Well, I, I thought Jonathan's answer was good. I mean, I think the community, of, I think we've learned in Miopar over the years that Canada really needs this community of practice, more than, probably more than, I don't know, more than any other country, but we we are so decentralized and we have to be, right? I think it was maybe, I can't remember now who, um, Maybe it was Ian actually uh, pointed out there was no, we don't have a central ocean mapping place in Canada. Well, you know, probably doesn't make sense to have a central ocean mapping place in Canada because we've got the longest coastline in the world and it's every bit of it's different and the people are different and the conditions are different. So, you know, more than any other country, probably, we need to find these different structures rather than centralization that might work in a country like Germany with a tiny coastline, yeah. rather, we have to find other structures which are decentralized, but encourage our limited resources to be used and shared effectively. So that's something Miopar has been committed, I would say has learned the importance of over a decade. And um, it's the basis for this, this buzzword, we always use coordinated Canadian approach because coordination is probably more important for Canada than almost, almost any other country, right? So yeah, Jonathan, your point on that, I, I think, uh, if the community of champions can form the basis for a community of practice connecting uh, outwards. But I would say the other thing we've learned is, and I think it was pointed out elsewhere that these communities don't happen unless they're resourced, right? They don't happen just on the basis of goodwill. I think it was probably Emmanuel said that. Um, they need to be funded because it requires real energy and energy still costs money and time. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah. I thought the Jonathan's point was exactly right on, though. Yeah. Good. No, thanks, Doug. And yeah, with that, I think uh, you know, moving on to maybe this discussion on what what are some of the the threats to the sustainability of uh, current communities of practice and others. I mean, we we know definitely funding is key. We know that it takes a lot of work, and you need to have uh, people in place and enough capacity. To, to tackle this on a daily day-to-day -day basis. So, but perhaps there's other thoughts uh, from your experience as well. If anyone wants to go next. Sherry? Um, I guess I could speak to two threats and, and one being tagging along with the administrative stuff. I think the staff that you have um, within the COP, I think they're they're the key to the success of the community practice. So having um people that are dedicated, preferably, you know, if they're in the research field, if they do similar research, I think that just lends itself to engaging a wider audience. Um, and um, just, again, talking a little bit about administration, um, if there is turnover in staff, I think it's really important to have good handover. If there's, if that fails, then it's really hard to continue the sustainability um, and just keep the community and practice engaged. And, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges that we all face is just engagement. How do we continue to engage people meaningfully? And I think that's very important. Um, one of the things that we've done is have targeted events. So instead of just having, you know, the national forum was a way to get a variety of stakeholders, but, you know, having these small events targeted for students or HQPs are really important because it's dedicated to them. And it's, you know, instead of blathering, like we have nine events going on throughout the year, attend all of them. Uh, we all know capacity is an issue for everybody, so having targeted events is really important. Um, and I think uh, the second threat I think I wanted to speak about is just long-term engagement. Like, how do we do that? Um, and I was going to pose that question to others. Like, we've had a challenge to do that, you know, to keep, um, you know, writing blogs, having newsletters. Those are great. But I think how do we have meaningful engagement? That's something that we've struggled with. Um, and, you know, we've looked at other ways of doing that, maybe having like a meaning, like a dedicated Slack channel. But I um, I think we've had 
more success with just having one or two dedicated platforms that we can share our resources rather than having nine different platforms and having people engage in all of them because that's just you know too much uh, for people to digest so i just wanted to pose it to other communities of practice you know um how do we meaningfully uh, meaningfully engage with with participants thanks Sherry. those those are yeah good comments and i think that last one on that balance uh, striking that balance uh, with the community of what's useful and what it becomes a little bit overwhelming uh, cindy had started to speak to that uh, but i'm sure others will have some experiences as well ian you want to go next yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just sort of echo this, this threat idea of uh, of, in, of engagement. I, I think is it is really key to keep people interested and to keep, especially to show the value in engaging. Um, and it's been, you know, what we one of the things we've tried to do is try to provide a balance of the type of events or the type of things that we're focusing on that can ben, you know, either benefits everybody or benefits one group here and one group here and uh, within the community of practice and. And we've we found it it has been difficult to get people to engage. The only real effective way we've had engagement is through online meetings like this. I mean, we can set up all the different platforms and digital engagement tools, but nobody uses nobody will use them um, except for you know me. I'll host things or put things on, or our other people will. Uh, but to, to have a you know to send out a, a Zoom meeting request to everybody in the community of practice and say this this is when we're meeting this month after a doodle poll. Um, you know, even if only 15 or 25 percent of the people show up, it does still continuously provide engagement to uh, to the group that want to engage. And then sometimes that's different depending on the month and what people are interested in. But that's uh, that's been the most effective way that we've found. I'm, I'm always open and looking for other ways to to try to reach out and connect to people, though. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Emmanuel, you had some comments, then Cindy. Uh, yeah, if I find uh, my view would be one of the threats to the COPs is to kind of fall into a routine and you repeat your activities, you send your tweets and you do your workshop and then you're happy. But I think at, uh, at some point, it's uh, we need to also reinvent ourselves. Having here in our COPs, it's also well, we have a steering committee, but I think after a while, uh, we can run a bit out of steam and ID. And again, we'll go back to the classic uh, activities. And I think uh, renewal, renewal of ideas, renewal of people is very important and keeping uh, kind of keeping the history in mind as well to uh, not repeat. So I think that uh, that can be a threat to the COPs and we try maybe uh, what I see, if we're not careful, we try to look inside at each other and it's become kind of, a, even if it's a big, it can become a kind of a closed uh, compartment as well. So I like we would go back to kind of uh, engagement to not forget that we kind of here to serve maybe a, a community, not to serve ourselves. And it's not always, uh, not always easy. And I agree. Uh, Engagement, I find through, uh, we're thinking about how can we engage differently than with a meeting because a meeting or a webinar or thing like that, I think everyone goes, we're full of, uh, you know, goodwill and we're asking questions and then everyone goes, oh, man, there's no follow up on it really. Uh, so maybe looking at maybe smaller activities, we targeted smaller, um, with maybe a smaller achievement, a smaller objective, but make sure it's being realized and, and follow, followed up on. I'll be some of my uh, thoughts here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Taking small steps as well, mm -hmm. and not trying to kind of solve every big problem. Thanks, Cindy. Yeah, um, uh, just following up on the engagement. Um, I remember when we were putting together the community of practice. I read some of the material about <clears throat> the people who kind of originated the idea, I suppose. And um, one thing that I read was that um, you know. There's a spectrum of involvement that you can expect from your community members, and not everyone is going to be fully active and engaged. And, you know, there's there's going to be some people who are, you know, they're going to be very happy just to check in on you occasionally, maybe, you know, visit your website once in a while, glance at your newsletter. And then there there might be a handful of, of people, maybe a few, one or two or three that are really excited and become kind of a champion or, and that might not even be sustained. It might be just one person at a time and they become really interested and active and they contact you. And that has been our experience. So I think some of it is 
you know, don't expect everybody in your community to have the time and capacity and to, to be as, invo you know, fully involved. Um, so I think that, I think it, I think it might've been one of the other people, one of the other presenters here mentioned that they have a variety of sort of passive and active, you know, engagement methods. And I think that's, it's basically, you know, the way to go. You kind of find a balance, you give people the opportunity and, according to people's time and interest, they'll take it. And I think that the, uh, the way, I guess, looking at measuring the, eva you know, the value of your community, um, I think that if your community still continues to move along, you still attract people who are already in your community to events, and you're attracting new people to your events. Um, you know, I think that that says something to the health of the community. And, um, and it does take, I, I, I think of it as like a garden, you know, you really kind of have to cultivate and tend your community. <laughs> and if you, and if you let it go, then, you know, people can dwindle away. And, uh, and that takes the sort resources, time and, and funding, of course. So, um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for those points. Megan. Yeah, similar to what's been said, it's the, the engagement and really knowing that what we're doing is is serving what the community practice needs is is a bit of a struggle and some of the ways we've been trying to address that with our community is um, i've been running polls at our webinars to ask people what topics they want to see in the future uh, to get a sense of you know what direction people's interests are, are trending and what aspects of risk they're they're most interested in and you know encouraging people to to contact we generally have sort of a committed core of people who show up to to webinars and um, sometimes ask questions, not always. And then uh, so it, it appears that people are enjoying the content and finding it useful. But yeah, there's not a lot of what you'd call active engagement um, beyond sort of a, a smaller core of people. So we kind of have a core of more engaged people and then a, a broader network of people who are maybe have a passing interest and want to stay uh, in, in touch and, and get the, the updates and maybe get the links to the, the webinars recordings after the fact, if they can't make it um, in person. And it, but it is, it is kind of a, a struggle to, to know, okay, is this actually what people need? What else could we be doing? And so I've been, I've been thinking about different ways of, of uh, trying webinars, like maybe not having, so many speakers, but maybe having a speaker and then spend more time having discussion or or pose some questions and it could fail horribly, um, but it could also be interesting. So um, I'm planning to try and test that out maybe once or twice this year and kind of see how that goes and if yeah. people find it valuable. Yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, adapting, right, uh, as you go. And I think, you know, trying to, to understand the different ups and downs of your community, what works, what doesn't, what what keeps people engaged and what different levels. So no, I do appreciate uh, all your comments on that. I think we were, we're getting to the end of, of the symposium. So I'm gonna ask Doug to just uh, give us a, a few closing remarks, but first, obviously, thank you to all the presenters. Uh, thanks for your patience with the little whiteboard uh, situation that didn't work as planned, but we're going to try and maybe follow up with an email uh, and send the link, and hopefully some of you might want to go back and engage with the whiteboard. We are going to try and produce some sort of debrief report uh, about the symposium, trying to capture some of the key messages that everybody, all the presenters put forward. I think that would be a useful thing for everyone because we can share it, but also maybe for others who are looking to uh, establish communities of practice to also use it as a little sort of resource of, of you know, the experiences that we have seen uh, at Neopar over the, the last uh, many years. So thanks again, everyone. Uh, Doug, if, uh, yeah, take it away. Oh, uh, just really briefly, I'd just like to echo uh, Rodrigo's thanks. First of all, to um, to the organizers of this mini symposium, you know, including some who weren't able actually to be here for, for, uh, for uh, you know, just uh, un unfortunately. Um, but uh, thanks for the organization. But mainly, I'm going to say uh, thanks to the presenters and the, you know, the community of practice leaders and the coordinators. You know, this is uh, 
not all, you know, sometimes a little bit of a thankless task. The re I'm sure you feel sometimes, you know, the rewards are sometimes not immediate, but longer term. And um, what we've seen, I think, in this uh, session is a lot of dedication, a lot of drive and a lot of uh, innovative ideas for how to bring a community together across uh, across Canada. And, um, you know, we've seen such on one hand, such a really kind of wide range of variety of topics and activities going on and some that certainly we were not aware of. <laughs> and it's really interesting to see the variety. But we've also seen, you know, common themes, common approaches, um, despite the great diversity of, of topics and themes. And, and so that testifies again to the exchange of ideas that's so important, right? Um, but mainly what came across was dedication and vision. So uh, thanks for that and hard work. And as Cindy was talking about, you know, the issues of engagement and the difficulties of keeping people engaged and stuff. And I think her analogy was, and, uh, you know, and, uh, and also probably Megan's comments after that, you know, that, you know, difficult knowing if people actually are getting anything out of this or not. I think, Cindy, your analogy was a garden, but I must admit, I was thinking about my family, you know, and especially, you know, teenagers are sometimes a little bit like that, right? You kind of show up for events, but you don't really know if they want to be there, or if they're getting anything out of it. So that was the analogy that crossed through my mind. And, and yet it's, we know it's important, right? And we know it's important to keep people together and, and, and communicating. So, you know, oh, Mirpar has learned how important the community of practice model is, still working on, you know, with your input on how to make it work uh, effectively. But we are hoping, you know, of course, that as an organization that we will be supported uh, under the Strategic Science Fund to continue promoting a Canadian co coordinated Canadian approach, um, you know, by communities of practice, one of our kind of central tools but you know, others that Richard mentioned, CUSE and the National Research Vessel Task Team, all of these ways in which we can encourage people to work together across disciplines, across regions, languages, and uh, sectors uh, on, on, common, on common topics. So we're really hoping, I hope you've all got your fingers crossed as well, um, that we'll be able to move forward. Um, and we, if we do move forward, we will have communities of practice as a very, very central element of um, most of the components of things we do. Um, so, and that includes being open to new groups and new ideas and new topics. Um, so I, I think I can speak on behalf of certainly Rodrigo and the Miopar staff, but also uh, the new Miopar scientific directors, Fanny Noizet and, uh, and Brent Els, uh, say that the, the communities of practice are, are going to continue in out as part of our vision anyway, moving forward. And um, it was really gratifying to see uh, all the activity um, and all the ideas um, being discussed together uh, at this session. So thank you. I think that's all I had to say, Rodrigo. That's wonderful. Thank you, Doug. That's great. And uh, thank you, everyone. Hope to uh, reconnect with everyone soon.